In this fourth episode of our five-part series, your Long March journey continues and mine begins. I take over from Tenran and take you for one big beautiful adventure in Aba Prefecture, where the Red Army Trail is a terrific tale of triumph and tragedy. Join me on Travelog. June 1935 and the Long Marchers have reached Aba Tibetan and Chiang Autonomous Prefecture in the north of Sichuan Province. This is where we'll spend this episode beginning with some good news for the weary troops, a chance encounter with some comrades. So finally here we are in the town centre of Xiaojin County. For me it's been a pretty short and painless trip but for the Long Marchers it's been almost 300 days on the road. But here in Xiaojin they could eat, they could drink, they could wash and they could rest and that's after they met up with the 4th Red Army and for that, Xiaojin County is known for that particular moment in time. It was definitely cause for celebration. The 1st Red Army, those who'd embarked on the expedition from Jiangxi, including the communist leaders, they'd just lost tens of thousands of men and women in the snowy mountains. So imagine their joy when the vanguard ran into the 4th Red Army here. Situated on the Tibetan Plateau, Xiaojin is a magnificent mosaic of cultures and during the Long March, it's believed that more than 1,000 people from the Tibetan and Chiang ethnic minorities signed up with the Red Army. Wandering around its streets, I find something that may come as a surprise to the casual visitor, a little cathedral. This Catholic church that I'm walking into was built in the early 1900s and it's famous for being the place where there was a big gala celebrating the reunion of the 1st Red Army and the 4th Red Army. Now the church is no longer a site of worship, but it's been transformed into somewhere that educates tourists about what happened here during the Long March. Now down here, we see buildings left in their authentic, original state and this is where a lot of the leaders would have stayed. Over there is where Mao Zedong stayed, and over there is the meeting room where lots of important decisions were made. Now, the church itself is renovated, and it's been transformed into a museum. Let's go. Christianity has been present in China since the Tang Dynasty, which lasted from 618 to 907 AD. And it wasn't unusual back in the 1930s to see missionaries at work in the southwest region of the country. What was unusual, though, was for a church to be the site of such a momentous event. It was here in this compound that the communist leaders reached a crucial decision. From Xiaojin, they would head north through the grasslands, which would ultimately prove to be the deadliest natural obstacle on the entire route of the Long March. But first, something a little lighter. I'm meeting Yang Huazhen. Her special skill, Tibetan embroidery, is listed as part of China's intangible cultural heritage. Her workshop is an oasis of colour, creativity and concentration. There are four major regional styles of Chinese embroidery. Suzhou, Hunan, Guangdong, Sichuan. Tibetan embroidery isn't one of them, but it is one of the main ethnic styles, famous for its use in making tankas or wall hangings on a Buddhist theme. Ms. Yang tells me her stories her uncle told her about the long marches who passed through her village all those decades ago. Times are much better now, and embroidery is done more for decoration and admiration than practicality. But back then, the locals made and embroidered shoes and clothes for the Red Army. And she even had family members enlist. Well, this isn't a colour photograph of one of them, but it's just as good as one, right? If not better, in fact. portrait, along with a couple of tankas, are Ms. Yang's proudest pieces of embroidery. And she's keen to show me her favourite one of all. 
，嗯，对，这个，对，就这幅、啊，这幅女杜牧呀，它的色彩丰富，嗯，嗯、呃，绣出来的针法也多，还有它的呃刺绣的这个光泽度，嗯，好，嗯，更重要的是它的眼神，嗯，佛像的眼神，它的面相很好。You know, it's really hard to believe that that was created with needle and thread, and a lot of patience and skill as well. Uh, this you did for how long? Uh, I did for a year. A year. Yeah. 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 那你觉得我可以随想？可以啊，好啊，可以啊，好。哎，好，是怎么样？嗯，哎哎，仔细，这样三角形。嗯嗯，我试一下。嗯，这个这个颜色是对吗？对的。She's giving me a different color. Maybe it's a good thing. So uh. After which he can unravel all my horrible work. I can't say I was born to embroider, but it's a bit of therapeutic fun, and Miss Young seems entertained. This is Zhang Zhou's work. Yes. 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 嗯，针法还是好多是相通的。哦。嗯，题材呢，我们除了嗯刺绣弹卡，嗯嗯之外，嗯这个是最高记忆了吧？哦。然后普通的就是融入生活，嗯，比如是刺绣我们的藏族服饰，对吧？嗯，这些嗯家里面的装饰，还有包包、背包这些用的，这些就是。它来源于生活嘛，嗯，嗯，学好之后，可能要六年吧，啊，六年左右就开始做人像，对，刺绣绣人像，然后学到刺绣唐卡，哦，嗯嗯，主要是自己的悟性，嗯，好吧 ，It's probably gonna take me an entire lifetime to learn how to do that, um, but yeah, it's just incredible to see. That with you know needle and thread and a zillion stitches, you can create masterpieces that have so much color and and texture to them, and also so much cultural and history. You know, I can understand why UNESCO listed it as a cultural heritage. Tibetan embroidery is as much a spiritual undertaking as an art form. By comparison, Suzhou embroidery is distinct because of its depictions of nature, like flowers and birds. Hunan embroidery for its starkly contrasting shades of black, white, and grey, Guangdong embroidery for its gaudy, symmetrical patterns, and Sichuan embroidery for its refined craftsmanship using satin and silk. Anyway, now that I've worked my fingers, I reckon it's time to work my stomach. 35 kilometers of rugged roads north of Xiaojin town center lies a little village called Mu Po. Guys, meet my new mate, Maydor. She's very kindly invited me over to her Tibetan family household. And this is where they live, deep in the mountains of Xiaojin County. And this is their home. It's very typically Tibetan in style, except for one thing. The roof, instead of being flat, is slanted. And that's because it rains often in this area. Now, I'm not here to talk about architecture. I'm here to try a very local specialty called Tibetan hot pot. So excited! Thank you. This must be the home. What an incredible place to be. Wow. Look at that view. Holy moly. And I guess here I'll be dining al fresco. Perfect! I honestly can't imagine a better place to eat. And without further ado, lunch is served. <gasps> that looks incredible. I feel like I've been waiting my whole life for this. <laughs> oh, wow. 
，里面全是我们的腊肉，然后我们当地的那些呃特色菜，然后野菜都在这里边。然后我们藏族呢吃火锅呢都是，呃，所有的菜都是一碟一碟叠好了，然后这样看。Okay. So it's it's not like the typical hot pot, right? That you know it's just boiled meat, but it's actually more like an art form. It's been layered, you know, layers upon layers of delicious food. I'm so excited. All right, can't wait to get stuck into this. I think I'm going to start with a a slice of meat. It's going to be really hot, isn't it? Oh, that is amazing. It's just like squishy fat falls apart in your mouth. Yeah, I'm not too. I'm not too. All right. Mm. Mm. Tibetan hot pot isn't actually an age-old tradition. It's a product of geographical location. We're in Sichuan, famous for its spicy hot pot, and relatively recent improvements in socio-economic conditions. Mm. I think the best part about the hot pot. Is the meat? It's like it's almost like prosciutto, and it's a little bit salty. Not very spicy like Sichuan hot pot, which most people are familiar with. Um, doesn't leave you breathing fire afterwards and regretting it the next day. Yeah, it's very tasty. And I think it's the perfect combination with my yak butter milk tea. Mmm, and also. There's this. I was wondering what this was before. Apparently, it's just butter, and how they eat it is they just pop it into their mouth and let it melt. So much. It's too much. Too much. Here goes the heart attack. Oh my god. I can feel my arteries clotting up already. So, uh, Maidwell failed to mention beforehand、mm. that the usual portion she ingests at one time is about a tenth of what I just ate. Never mind, I'd do it ten times over for a home-cooked meal in a place like this again. After lunch, Maidwell leads me to a surprise she's prepared for us: a traditional Tibetan performance. I'm in a dream. I've strayed from the hilly paths into a clearing to peek in on elaborately costumed Tibetan men and women taking part in a sacred ceremony. It's a battle dance, part of the heritage of a tribe of Tibetans called the Jiarong, who are native to this area. It was danced before battle to pray for success, or afterwards to give thanks for victory. They say it was performed for the long marches. Perhaps another reason for the Red Army's eventual success. This battle dance is recognised as prefecture-level intangible cultural heritage, but like so many customs, it's under threat, as fewer and fewer people from the younger generations are learning it. Maidor herself knows the dance, but admits that the life she's pursuing is a world away from her mother's. That said, she's still a very proud Tibetan. <laughs> This is the very first time I've been exposed to authentic Tibetan culture, and it's really been eye-opening and absolutely mind-blowing as well. You know, this place is steeped in so much culture and tradition and spirituality, and it's not every day that you get to see something like this. So I am really one lucky human being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Coming up next, celebrating the cultural patchwork of Songpan, an ancient walled city home to four major ethnicities, and to some radiant revelry at night.
We've been on the road for about seven hours now and we're still not even halfway. Uh, it's about a 500 kilometer winding drive through the mountains. My butt's getting a little bit sore as well. And the roads aren't in perfect mid condition. So, you know, sometimes there's a lot of traffic because of the road work. And sometimes I feel like I'm riding on a jackhammer. And also up here in the Tibetan Plateau, the weather's a bit fickle. So you can be driving through, you know, a hailstorm, and then the next minute it's it's really foggy, so it's slippery and you can't see in front of you. And then it's really sunny. You feel like you're being fried into a human hot chip. I honestly don't know how the long marches did it. You know, they were doing this on foot as well. Um, and here I am sitting in a vehicle, whinging about my sore butt. We're on our way north through Aba Prefecture to Songpan County, home to the only official national level monument commemorating the Long March. The main reason why Songpan was the one place chosen on the route's 12,500 kilometers is that two of the five most important meetings during the trek were held here. It's also the starting point of what veterans recall as the toughest section of the entire expedition. Before we head there, I'm going to spend a day or two exploring the old part of Songpan. It's about 310 kilometers from Sichuan's capital city, Chengdu, and in the Tang Dynasty was an important military post and center for economy and trade. My first task? To find somewhere I can spend the night. And before long, it looks like mission accomplished. You know, there are a lot of great accommodation options here in the ancient city. And it's easy to find a guest house like this, where it's designed in old traditional local styles. But for a very reasonable price, you can get something super comfortable and with great new amenities. But first, I think I'm going to go check out the ancient town. The old town is encircled by a 6.2 kilometer long wall and is accessible by seven gates. And the best way to tackle this place? Just stroll around. I'm in Songpan ancient city, which was founded in the Yuan dynasty, but it's still bustling today, as you can see around me. You could call it a tourist town, but it's still really, really authentic. And you can see lots of locals still going about their everyday lives. But I think the best thing about this place is that you can wander around its city walls, and you start to notice how all the four ethnicities, so you've got the Tibetans, you've got the Qiang, you've got the Hui and the Han, Everyone seems to get along so well and they just live harmoniously in here. It's really like a cultural kaleidoscope. You could just people watch all day. My immediate reaction is to compare it to the old walled city of Jerusalem. I remember browsing the distinct quarters, the Jewish, Muslim, Christian and Armenian, where each was like a unique microcosm of the religion. But here, it really is like wading through a melting pot there's no sense of segregation at all. When darkness falls, the town becomes brilliantly illuminated. But it's not always like this. It's a special occasion tonight, and, of course, despite the rain, I want in on the action. It seems like I'm not the only one with that idea. <laughs> Annually, around this time of year, there's a light festival held in Songpan where the entire ancient city is decorated with all sorts of lights and lanterns. And people come from all across the county and, of course, from even further afield to celebrate. There are ethnic minority dances and a lot of them are considered intangible cultural heritages. And, of course, there are lots of lights as well. Now, it hasn't been the best weather so far. It's been raining cats and dogs, but it's eased up a little bit. And there's quite a good turnout as well, and also a lot of excitement. And you know what? It's just started. It's like the entire Aba prefecture has turned up in town for this local carnival. All four of the main ethnicities in Songpan take turns showcasing their intangible cultural heritage in the form of music and dance. It's a multi-sensory explosion of choreographed color and energy. According to recent figures, Tibetans account for around 43% of the population in Songpan, the predominantly Muslim Hui account for 15%, and the Qiang, 10%. Less than a third of the population identify themselves as Han, 
despite the Han ethnicity making up nine out of every ten people in China. It's this diversity that makes Songpan so special. And then some downtime before a whole day of sightseeing tomorrow. Songpan County isn't home to just a wide array of cultural heritages. We're here at Huanglong Scenic Area, which in 1992 was listed as a World Natural Heritage Site. Yep, I know another heritage to explore on the route of the Long March. Just hoping these storm clouds will go away. Well, rain, hell or shine, I'm always up for outdoorsy things, and today. I've even got my own personal guide, Ming Jiang. Here we go. This、uh, cable car ride still counts as outdoorsy, right? For the less sedentary, there's a hiking trail you can take that leads you up to the same spot we're headed to, and then it's a bit of a trek down, 3.6 kilometers to be exact. Oh, okay. So we get to see a lot of the attractions along the way. Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huanglong means yellow dragon, so called because from above, the park's natural limestone pools resemble a golden dragon materializing from the valleys. <laughs> That is just surreal. Look at the colors; they're just popping, even though you know it's kind of overcast. I haven't seen anything like this since Pamukkale in Turkey, and that's not surrounded by densely forested mountains like this. You know, where almost 90% of the area is vegetated. 那个颜色是从哪里来的？因为在我们黄龙景区呢，我们有三个泉眼，而五彩池它所处的那个位置呢，是离那个泉眼最近的位置。所以呢，在阳光的反射以及那个彩池的深浅度不一的状况之下呢，便会呈现出五颜六色的颜色。哦、oh, ，It's almost like a rainbow. Yeah, right. Rainbow. <laughs> It's instantly obvious why Huanglong is known as paradise on Earth, right? The cascading pools are formed from limestone deposited by mineral springs, and they're known as travertine terraces. Tens of thousands of snap-happy tourists flock here every day during peak season. We are now in the position of the Huanglong Park Nature Reserve. From this angle, we can see that its color is five colors. From this angle, we can see that its color is five colors. 来黄龙旅游的游客们呢，他们经常会问我们一个问题：嗯，你们采石的五颜六色，是不是因为你们放了很多的颜料进去了？ Oh. 其实呢，在这里呢，我想告诉大家的是，我们的采石啊是 one hundred percent natural。Did you hear that? One hundred percent natural. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. And not only that, Mingjiang was saying to me before that these terraces here are not only the widest but also the、right. deepest、Absolutely. in Huanglong. Yeah. And also in the entire world. Right. I think I like these ones better than the ones up there because、yeah. you can get much closer to them.、Yeah. They're almost like swimming pools. I want to dive in. It's tempting. <laughs> Huanglong、yeah. covers an area more than twice the size of Singapore, at a height of up to five and a half thousand meters. Maybe it's the altitude or the heart-stopping panoramas, but I'm feeling a little lightheaded, and 100% spellbound by Songpan. Coming up next, the glorious grasslands that hide a harrowing week-long chapter in Chinese history, where the human spirit was tested to its limits. Ruogai, the northernmost county in Sichuan Province. We're spending several hours on the road again, but compared to the long marches, many months on foot, it really is ultimate luxury. Especially with backdrops like this, we're finally bound for the grasslands, also known as Ruo Gai or Zoiga marshlands. They're notorious for their lush but lethal swampy splendor. As I follow the crowds, I wonder if any of them are descendants of those who lived to tell the tale. Eighty or so years ago, the Red Army trudged for a week through the beautiful bog, which turned out to be a death trap. It's around the same time of year now as it was when the long marches reached here, hot in the day but freezing at night. 
This was the unforgiving side of Mother Nature. The grasslands swallowed men and horses in seconds if they deviated from the footsteps of those in front. And when rations ran out, the Red Army resorted to eating boiled leather belts and drinking urine. It's definitely hard to believe. This is the Ruogai grassland, and it's the largest high-altitude marsh area in the entire world. It's also part of the most jeopardous natural obstacle that the long marches had to face. It's kind of hard to believe though, isn't it? It's such a spectacular region. But actually, more lives were lost here in one week than any other leg of the journey. And in fact, some estimates put it at 20,000 casualties. But that was in August 1935. These days, it's a very popular tourist attraction. If there's one place that you have to go in Ruo Gai, it's called Huahu or Flower Lake. And if you come at the end of June, most of this area is carpeted in yellow and purple flowers. It's kind of the middle of summer right now, but it's still gorgeous, isn't it? All you need to do is just take it all in and breathe. Well, that's if you're not too short of breath. Oxygen is a tad thinner up here, as we're more than 3,300 metres above sea level. And it's a breathtaking view, after all. And then, after taking a zillion photos and soaking it all up, we decide to take one last glance at Aba from the top of the hill, overlooking the first bend of the Yellow River. Well, this is it from Aba Prefecture. We've now crossed through three counties that the Red Army also crossed through after the 1st and 4th Battalions converged, but of course they did it on foot. Xiaojin, Songpan and Ruogai. These places are not only testament to human endurance against the odds, but also testament to China's natural and cultural heritages like the Tibetan uh, battle dance and also fantastic landscapes like this. But of course, this isn't where our Long March adventure finishes because this isn't where the Long March ends. It ended in a place called Yan'an in Shanxi province, and that's our next destination. My name's Dewey. Join me next week for the fifth and final installment of our Long March series.